All right. So there was a lot of organizational stuff. And now let's get to our amazing panelists. Um, let's uh, do a quick round of introductions, maybe. Um, um, and uh, let's uh, start with Mitzi. So I am uh, Mitzi Janelle Tan. I am a climate justice activist based in Metro Manila, Philippines. I organize with Fridays for Future um, on different levels. So in the Philippines, where we're called Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, and then also with doing stuff in Asia, and then with MAPA, which is Most Affected Peoples and Areas, and then also international. Um, I'll pass it on to Iante. Hi, I'm Iante Minard from the Netherlands. Uh, my pronouns are she, they. Um, I am active in Fridays for Future, and I have been for two and a half years now. And I have done loads of different things, uh, organizing actions and going to international meetings and campaigns and all of that. Um, so that, I think, I don't know, uh, Freya? Hi, um, I'm Freya Tishwitz. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm from the UK, I live near London, um, and I've been organizing with the UK Student Climate Network, which is um, basically like Fridays for Future in England. Um, and yeah, I've also done um, stuff with COP26, uh, which was in Glasgow, um, and with a lot of other organizations as well. Um, and I've been doing climate activism for two and a half years, so I started when I was 15. Um, so yeah. uh, I'm going to pass to Lauren. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren McDonald. I am part of the Stop Cambo Coalition um, to stop the Cambo oil field uh, off the west coast of Shetland from going ahead. I'm from Glasgow. I've been involved in various types of activism for several years. I'm 21 years old, so still got a few years of youth left in me, I think. Um, but yeah, really like lovely to see people even younger than me like being involved in this for a while. That really warms my heart. But um, can can that, somebody else pass on because Let's I Let's pass it on to Hilda. Cool, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Hilda Flavia Nakabe. I come from Uganda. I use she her pronouns and I'm glad to be part of this event. I organize with the Fridays for Future movement and the founder Fridays for Future here in Uganda. I also uh, part of the SOP, the East African Crude Oil Pipeline, which is the SOP ECOP campaign. And yeah, the goal is to phase out fossil fuels. Thank you. Great to have you all. Um, uh, and um, to see so many different faces. And uh, I see some more people are introducing themselves in the chat as well. So we do not have only have a very international panel, but also very international audience, which I think is, is great. Um, we'll do another round, I think. Um, and we're very curious to hear about your experiences in organizing. Maybe you can all say a little bit more about the kind of, you know, groups that you've been organizing with, um, how, you know, what kind of experiences you've made in, in organizing, especially young people in, uh, where in your own communities. Um, and if you want, you can also talk a little bit about the fossil fuel industry and your encounters with the fossil fuel industry. Um, uh, I'm, you've just uh, passed it on. Uh, uh, I'm just gonna, you know, maybe uh, let's uh, do it the other way around and start again with Hilda, and then you can pass it through your own ranks as you want, if that is fine. Hilda, do you want to start? Hi, um, well, I will start by saying again that I work with the Fridays for Future movement and I have been part of the Fridays for Future movement since 2019 until now. I founded Fridays for Future here in Uganda and 
2019. That was in 2019 as well. Well, since that time, uh, up to now, we've been doing different activities, organizing different events. As a climate activist, I didn't think, my passion was in climate, but I didn't think it will be this hard. <laughs> it's not that easy, especially coming from a country that uh, doesn't really, um, uh, we don't have, we have the rights, but then we don't have them physically, so you can practice the rights that are in the books. So you just have to like live by the word. So it hasn't been very easy for me in Uganda organizing such events, both local and international events. Sometimes uh, events are interrupted by police, by local government, by uh, communities. So it has been a rough ride, but above all, we have um, done a lot of actions, a lot of uh, activities in different communities, in different regions, and we have some results, of course. And uh, the Friday Sufficha movement here is growing. We have a network of 53,000 students and youth. We are in six universities, and we are in four regions all over Uganda. And we are still growing. Um, some of the activities we've been able to do uh, most recently was a project about COP, Conference of Parties, which was just held in October. So we had the Youth Voices for COP26. And um, this went on very well because we were looking for Youth Voices to add in a paper so that we can put our recommendations to the COP26 delegate so that not all of the voices, especially those voices that are not often heard or often don't get a chance to attend such meetings can get to be heard or aired. And uh, this has, that was very good because uh, we managed to make a paper and present it to the COP delegates, the Ugandan COP delegates. And this was presented at uh, COP26. We had uh, some engagements with the people about the recommendations that were in this paper and we are trying to build projects um, around it. Uh, those will start this year, of course. Um, well, as my personal experience of being an activist and organizing uh, uh, with uh, climate justice organizations, of course, it has had a lot of ups and downs, like I said, uh, because in my country, you can't uh, just express your, like yourself or your feelings. And as um, as a woman, as a lady, as a girl in my community, it's not really, it's not um, often that a woman comes out and speaks out about what they feel or um, what uh, they want, like their passion. So I was uh, criticized a lot. Uh, Many people were, you know, throwing those bad words. You have to go back to school. Uh, why are you missing classes to fight for climate change? This is not something that is there. This is not something that happens. And um, growing up, I used to see these effects in my community and in my home, in my own family. So I always hoped that uh, there is a reason attached to this. My grandmother often thought that it is the gods that are punishing us with all these climate effects. We had a plantation and very often we could have like droughts. We could have like high temperatures drying the crops, crops withering, uh, low gains, um, the streams used to dry a lot. So she often thought that maybe the gods are punishing us for something we did that we don't know. But I wasn't convinced with this until I reached university and learned about climate change. So I decided to do something about it so that other people don't have to pass through the same experience I passed through growing up. And I remember a time when my professor, I, I reached out to my professor to tell him about climate change, see how we can organize around the university to make other people aware of climate change and try to do some actions. And I was so disappointed because he told me that uh, climate change 
does not exist and uh, if it does then it's got to do something about it not me i'm just a girl and i don't have any power i don't have uh, anything on me that could help or save our worlds of our earth so i felt really bad because this is someone i looked up to to have you know knowledge and um someone i always hoped that would understand better or had a better idea of what I was presenting. So when I knew that I was alone in this fight, I had to educate myself about climate change. So I searched on the internet, trying to find out information about this. I read a lot, I'd done a lot of online courses. And uh, when I got to know about this, I organized at my university, uh, different campaigns, different projects, make people aware, of course, with our weekly climate strikes uh, uh, on the roadsides, trying to talk to people about climate change, what it really is. It came with, you know, good results, but also a lot of critiques. But uh, you have to, I had to move on because I had an aim, I had a goal, I had a reason as to why I was doing what I was doing. And this helped me a lot because Every time I feel like um, I'm overwhelmed or um, overly criticized about what I do, I just have to remember the reason as to why I started all this and that keeps me going. I think Thank this you. is something that I would love to share with everyone. And Thank you, um, yeah. yeah. Do you uh, want to I wrap can... up? <laughs> okay. So, uh, that has been my experience and maybe I would advise if uh, you have something that you are passionate about. You don't really have to think about what people say about it or what other people um, uh, criticize about it. If you are passionate about something, just go for it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Shada. That's a, it's an amazing story and I think it's really, really inspiring. Some people are already commenting. Thank you for sharing. Do you want to pass it on to uh, one of the other panelists or should I do that? Okay, uh, let's pass it on to Lauren. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just again, in case anyone's forgotten. Um, my name is Lauren McDonald. I'm a member of the Stop Campbell campaign. Um, and I'm just going to chat for a few minutes about, um, you know, how we managed to stop the Campbell oil field from going ahead and the role of the youth in this and um, the, the youth's sort of um, yeah, experiences and um, mindset on things that led to the situation that we're in with Campbell. So just to really quickly cl clarify, in case any of you haven't heard of the Campbell oil field, it is a pr proposed offshore oil field that would be situated to the west of Shetland, um, which is off the north coast of Scotland. It was due to extract 170 million barrels of oil in only its first period of extraction and be in commission until 2050, by which point, um, well, that's the same year that the UK government has pledged to be carbon neutral. It was going to be owned by Shell and Sicker Point Energy. Um, however, due to our like relentless campaigning, Shell actually pulled out of the oil field in the first week of December 2021. And the week after the oil field was put on pause by Sicker Point. Um, so technically, we haven't completely stopped the oil field. We have paused it, but um, until Sicker Point could find another investor, to make up for shell pulling out, the oil field will not be eligible for approval. So um, basically we have stopped it for now. And <laughs> so just to provide a little bit more context on the wider picture of uh, proposed fossil fuel projects in the UK, there are 39 other coal, oil and gas projects due for approval in the UK by the year 2025 alongside Campbell. So 40 new fossil fuel projects just in the next um, three or four years. So there's still a lot of work to do to, the make, to make sure that the UK is not opening up any new fossil fuel infrastructure as the International Energy Agency last year stated that, um, you know, if we are to stay below 1.5 degrees, there must be no, fo no new fossil fuel infrastructure anywhere in the world. So this fight is really important. And if you're in the UK, um, 
you know there's a lot of oil fields and and coal mines and um yeah all of that to to get up in arms against so yeah i'll spend the rest of my few minutes just talking a little bit about the tactics that we used and our mindset so for those of you who aren't aware on how we campaign against Cambo, basically what we did was we built like a successful pressure campaign by focusing on public pressure and public opinion of opening a new oil field in the UK. Um, how we did this was mainly by going straight to those in power um, and you know, due to a lot of searching and work we managed to find opportunities to question um, Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, um, Tory ministers, um, Quasi Quarteng, Alok Sharma, who was also the COP26 president, even Boris Johnson was uh, asked about it by campaigners, and I confronted the CEO of Shell. Um, all of this happened in person about the oil field, so we managed to get in rooms with a lot of people in power. Um, I think this tactic was really smart for us because, you know, placing a youth who is like terrified for their future in front of a conservative minister, in front of the CEO of an oil company, it created quite a media stir and like somehow the public were suddenly on our side. Um, and yeah, I think that youth aspect was probably the most important thing in our success with Campbell. And the reason that I would say this is because I think generally the youth are probably a bit more ambitious about the fight for climate justice and a little bit more radical um, to illustrate this I actually had a conversation with an MP during COP26 where they said to me and my friends that decarbonizing the, the, the UK in time uh, to keep global warming between 1.5 degrees was impossible um, you know, at first hearing someone who's been involved in the political system in the UK for decades saying that climate justice was impossible, we felt really, really crap about it and, um, you know, deflated and questioning our worth. But then whilst reflecting on it, I realised that as youth, we don't have the privilege of believing that um, what we need to achieve is impossible because we are, the, we are the ones that are gonna to need to live through that breakdown for the longest. Our whole adulthood and our whole futures are at stake compared to um, you know, someone who's already lived over half of their life in terms of life expectancy. Um, similarly, um, MAPA or most affected people in areas, activists, do not have the privilege of believing that we do not have the power to achieve climate justice. Because, um, you know, if that were the case, many small island nations and, you know, many people all over the world, for them, that means certain obliteration of their land and certain death for large swathes of people. So that need for climate justice and understanding that it is literally our futures that are at stake and the present of many people all over the world today. Um, that's what drove us to success, because we genuinely believed we were going to win. Um, you know, I remember just after a successful high profile action that we did, put, I put a message in the UK Wide Stop Campbell group saying, if we play our cards right during COP26 and afterwards, we can genuinely win this fight. Um, and, you know, we have now. And like, I think actually believing that actively and having active hope was what got us there, you know, because it's, you, it was a youth led yeah. campaign. Yeah, I'm, I'm wrapping up now. It was a youth led campaign filled with people who have no choice but to believe that we can take down the fossil fuel industry. So I implore, implore all of you, um, obviously you're, you're here, you care about this, believe in yourselves, believe in your campaigns and believe in your ability to create change because we can do this. Thank you. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, do you want to pass it on? Yeah. Yeah, I'll pass to Freya. Hi, um, yeah, so <clears throat> that was amazing, Lauren and Hilda. Um, so in terms of like my background of organizing, I first started getting really involved in 2019, um, kind of February time with the school strikes um, in London. And over that year, massively saw them grew. Uh, I think the first strike had um, 15,000? No, I, a, a couple of thousand and then, we built up to having 100,000 in September 2019 on the streets of London, which was absolutely incredible. Um, so I do a lot of organizing in London, um, but I've also done quite a bit of organizing in my hometown, which is quite small, um, kind of just like a county town. Um, and I had a school, we had a school strike there on the 20th of uh, September 2019, which was amazing for me, even though like it didn't, you know, it just made the local news um my town like very rarely sees any political activism probably never seen a protest in its life um and 
I, I think that that is one of the most, has been one of the most amazing things to see come out of the youth movement is how we've created these discussions within our local communities and because of school striking within like our local vicinity we've really like brought the the discussion away from like a, we've really brought the discussion into all the different areas in the country which has been amazing to see I think beforehand a lot of activism was concentrated like a lot of the demos were just happening in the major cities in the UK um like London and you know Glasgow Edinburgh Manchester like a lot of activism was happening there and I think like it's amazing to see it happening across towns and cities. And that's one of, that's something I'm really passionate about in that I think like, if you want, if you want to do activism, you don't have to, you don't, you can just do it where you are. You can do it on issues that are local to you. And I feel like people around you connect a lot to things that are happening locally because they can see it with their eyes. Um, so if you fancy starting a campaign, you can just do it with people, with your mates, like with people that you know, you don't have to make anything, like it doesn't have to be something where you have to like create loads of stuff. Like you can just like go with your mates and start, sit outside your local town council with a placard. Um, and that's really powerful to your local community. Um, yeah, so I did that. And then kind of starting at the, uh, in 2021, 2022, 2020, like 2021, um, we, as UKC and London, so the UK Student Climate Network's uh, London group, we started a campaign uh, calling for the Science Museum to stop its sponsorship, um, to stop receiving sponsorships from Shell um, and Adani. Um, it's also sponsored by BP and Equinor, but we are focusing more on Shell and Adani because these are the most recent sponsorship announcements. Um, who are basically using a really, really crucial cultural institution um, that for me growing up was a massive, massive inspiration and somewhere I loved going to because I was like a bit of a science nerd. <laughs> but for so many kids, like it's such a great place to learn and to see that the these institute that these companies are using it as a greenwashing in, like opportunity is disgusting. Um, and we've we need to show to people that we will not, that they do not deserve to have a space within our society um, and within our culture. Um, so we need to get rid of that. Um, yeah, so in terms of that, we did, uh, we've done letter writing to boards, trust to like trustees, to the museum, to directors. Um, we've done, um, we kind of built up so, protests outside and then when that was failing we escalated um and attempted an occupation in june got kicked out by the police because they were like we're gonna arrest you um if you don't go out because you're it'll be aggravated trespass you'll be breaking the law um so and then in october we managed to stage a successful occupation um which was amazing and incredible to see how um how to really put pressure on the Science Museum. And we created a lot of media about that um, and a lot of stir, which was great to see. And then um, I organized around COP as well in November. Uh, we managed to organize a 35,000 strong march in Glasgow um, for the, on the Friday for the school strike. And then uh, with the COP coalition, there was a 100,000 strong protest on the Saturday, which was incredible to see. Uh, the people power and how as movements and as young people especially we managed to really for, like foreground um, indigenous and um, voices from the global south in that discussion which I think is something that is really really crucial to the youth movement um, and it's something that we've that we've perhaps distanced ourselves from traditional organizing or traditional NGOs the big NGOs in that regard um, so yeah, but I think, yeah, and I think like COP really highlighted to me the importance of equity in global discussions. And that's something that, that was the failure of COP was the lack of equity. Um, obviously the targets weren't good, but also there was no um, discussion. The, there was 
a lot of lack of finance and of uh, to the global south and of listening to those voices um, and of listening to their need for an, an, an equitable and a just transition, which was really disappointing to see, but we will continue to organise against, continue to organise for justice for everyone and a fairer society. Thank you, Freya. Really cool to see like this trajectory of kicking shell out of the Science Museum and then up until organising marches with thousands of people in Glasgow. Yeah, do you want to pass it on? Um, Yanta? Hi, okay, I might be a bit distracted because my cat is walking around in my room uh, wanting a lot of attention, but I'll try to focus. Um, yeah, so I've been active in the climate movement since May 2019. I was almost 16 at the time. Um, and I've heard from a lot of people that they had similar experiences in starting activism. Um, because for me, it was just like I went to one meeting and then suddenly I was really active and I didn't really know how that happened. And uh, but a lot was happening uh, at once. So it's kind of a whirlwind when you first join um, the climate movement or probably other movements as well. Uh, but that was a lot of fun because I got to do loads of different stuff. I went to Smile, that's like, that was um, a Europe, a Fridays for Future Europe meeting um, in the summer. And um, I did like a really cool action of a week. And I've done loads of stuff in the climate movement. Um, and I've learned a lot from that. I have don't have really like a specific campaign or action. I just do random stuff all the time and take up like different responsibilities. And I think a lot of people in the climate movement have a similar experience in that. Um, but for me, my biggest action was probably the 3rd of April uh, that was supposed to happen in 2020, but then the pandemic hit, which was really sad because like we had been working on that for like three months and put on in like a lot of energy and effort. And I'm pretty sure I had a burnout after that, but the action didn't happen. So, um, well, you get the image, I think. Um, so for activism, I think the most important thing is to watch your boundaries from the start because I didn't, and it's really difficult if you don't to get back into activism and to make sure you can still actually do what you love in there. Um, but that's not just the most, the, the other important thing in making sure you protect your energy and uh, make sure you're, you're able to contribute if you want to, is to find, uh, a way of to the activism that you love to find a project or to start a project or whatever uh, that you think is fun um i'm reading the comment <laughs> thank you um okay so um yeah so for example if you really love music you can join like the climate life action which is um making like a concert around music a concert around climate i mean um, and but if you love education, you can join a Teach the Future campaign or whatever you think is interesting or whatever you get your energy from, you can join or you can start that yourself. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a campaign. It can also be just loving to meet new people and then joining like uh, talking to different organizations for your movement. So find the thing that you love in in whatever way and help make like let that help you in your activism and that might take some time it did for me and might change so just try loads of different stuff and you'll find what you love i think um and i'll pass it on to mitzi hey everyone um so i'm not really sure where to start uh i i became an activist first in 2017 i think when i was able to talked to an indigenous leader of our land and he told us about how they were being harassed and displaced and killed and militarized and so simply he kind of just shrugged and chuckled and said that's why we have no choice but to fight back and the simple way of him saying that was what really burst my bubble of privilege because I realized that I had this quote-unquote choice to choose to be an activist and there are people who are so pushed into activism that even when it's so dangerous to be an activist in countries like the Philippines, it's worse if you don't become an activist because there are worse consequences if you don't fight back, such as 
all the fossil fuel companies and projects and the coal minings um, that the indigenous peoples are fighting against here in the Philippines. And it's not just the indigenous peoples, it's also the small farmers and the small fisher folk. And really, that's why my climate activism has always been centered around human rights and justice, because that's how I came into it. I learned from the indigenous leader and then I actively learned about the environmental um, emergency and then I stumbled myself upon the climate crisis. So I think that's something that's so important to remember that when we approach the climate crisis, it's not just as a scientific issue. It's not just as an issue. I think Elias already mentioned it earlier with the way um, the Shell Must Fall campaign is going that you it's not just about the carbon dioxide um, um, in the atmosphere, because if it was that, then you'd think that, oh, Shell can just, you know, lower its emissions a little bit and it'll be fine, but it's not. It, as Elias mentioned, it is something that's rooted in that colonialist system that we have today, that we have to change. And so the way that we do that in the Philippines, at least, is we make sure that we bring, you know, privileged students like myself to these frontline communities so that we can learn from them and we can really you know, stand in solidarity with their campaigns. And then we also create these um, empowering cl community-based climate modules so that it's climate information that's actually built and based on what they're experiencing. Because for me, even if I was privileged enough to already have climate education, the way they taught us was that it was melting ice caps and polar bears. And so I didn't even know that the typhoons I was experiencing every year and traumatizing so many of me and my family and friends was already the climate crisis. I didn't know that because of the way climate education was built. And really, I think that that's deliberate, but they don't teach us climate the way that it should be taught. They don't teach us climate justice. At most, they teach us about climate change and climate science, but sometimes it's not even accurate. Because if they gave us the tools to change the system, the system would be changed already. But of course, the system that is colonial and that is capitalist and is imperialist is not going to give you the tools to change it. You're going to have to find that in other ways. You're going to have to find that in ways outside of this system, outside of traditional education. And that's where the movement comes in. And that's where learning and building international solidarity comes in because it's so important that we ground ourselves in the realities of the communities that are already experiencing the injustices of the system today. And that's not just global South countries, but that's also um, migrant communities. That's also <clears throat> um, working class communities. That's also the communities of people of color and all of these communities that we should be learning from and listening to, even if they're not climate movements, even if they're not youth movements, even if they're different social movements, there's so much for us to learn from each other. Because in the end, it is the same thing that we're fighting against, just different, manifestations of it. I really think that the climate crisis is only a symptom of the system that was built to be unjust. And that's something that we have to change because it's not enough. I don't know if this is a hot take, probably not. It's not enough to just shut down fossil fuel industries. We have to make sure that when we build renewable energy systems, they're not in the same manner of the fossil fuel industries today that are extractive. Otherwise, we'll just end up having no minerals in the ground, right? Otherwise, we'll just end up displacing indigenous peoples for hydroelectric dams and displacing farmers for solar farms. And I say this because it's already happening here in the Philippines. And so it doesn't stop. It's It, it already seems so like such a gigantic task because it's like, we have to get rid of all fossil fuels and that's already so scary. And then you remember that it doesn't even stop there. That's just like step one. And then you have to keep going and really just change the way we use energy and sometimes that can be so overwhelming but what I like to remember is that I am not alone in this I joined this movement because I'm only joining the fight of environmental defenders who are already so strong on their own so I'm just helping that I'm just supporting that I'm just fighting alongside them and so they're already so strong and then I also remember that there's literally someone in every country fighting for the same thing that I am like just in this panel alone from several different countries. And, and when I think of it that way, it's almost like, how can we, you know, how can we lose? I remember I was also in the, the mobilization around COP26 in November. And honestly, that was so beautiful because it was just, it showed you the collaboration that's needed for us to save this world. The collaboration of different cultures coming across 
coming together and collaborating across different languages and across different cultures. And journalists would often ask me, what does climate justice look like to you? And I'm, I sometimes say, sometimes it looks like singing and dancing. And, and they're always like, what do you mean? And I'm like, go to our strikes. And literally there's always some form of singing and dancing. And it's the most beautiful thing because honestly, that's the world that we're fighting for. One where we are dancing and singing and just being happy and being gentle with one another. Thank you. I think that's a that's a beautiful um, way to like end this this first round of of discussions. And um, I just wanted to to check with you. I I understand there's right now a fundraiser also going on by the Youth Advocates for Climate Action in the Philippines about a recent um, uh, typhoon that hit one like one of the islands, right? So um, yeah, feel, feel free to share with the audience. And I think we just had like a, a lot of input. <laughs> I think a lot of points to, um, to a lot of threads to follow, up, a lot of points to catch on to. I think one of the things that, that I found really interesting and that I still find is, is absolutely amazing is how the, the, the youth movement has basically catapulted the broader like movement for climate justice from being like a, very decentralized, um, often, you know, kind of like not connected, very local kind of actions into a, a, a kind of a global mass movement that can mobilize millions of people. And I think Hilda mentioned that there's like more than 50,000 students in Uganda who are, who are signing up. Um, and, and others of you mentioned that, you know, this feeling of not being alone. And I think that that's something that's it's been really successful and perhaps it's related to the, the, the fact that, that youth movements often speak directly to the kind of material interests of a, of a whole generation, right? It's, um, it's I think, uh, and some of you have mentioned this, that, that those are issues that affect us directly and um, it, um, it often used to be the case, like even 10 years ago, that future generations were talked about as like, these passive uh, unborn generations that are to inherit a uh, distracted, completely devastated planet. But yeah, in a way, the future generations are us and we're here and um, we have interests that, that we have, we're defending um, and we're fighting for just as much as you know, other demographics, of course, that are um, affected directly by the climate crisis. And, I think linking up these struggles is something really powerful. Um, before I talk too much, um, I uh, encourage you all to ask questions in the in the chat. If you want to ask a question, you can also just put a star and then I can call upon you. If you have a really urgent question, you can put two stars into the chat. Uh, then I know that it's a really urgent question. Um, if uh, no one has a question yet, um, then, oh, there, there are questions already. So um, let's, um, uh, let's ask Andrew first. Andrew, do you wanna pose your question? Yes, sure. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, it's a wonderful and amazing work from, from everybody. Um, and I just, maybe this could be a question that, that um, not just for, I, I posed it to Hilda because this, you know, astonishing growth um, to 53,000, uh, but maybe, um, yeah, everyone would like to reflect uh, to some degree on how do you go about growing uh, uh, the movement, uh, spreading the word, building, kind of what are effective strategies for growing and organizing, uh, in other words. And I particularly posed it to Hilda because of this enormous growth um, in the two of 53,000 um, students. So that's my question. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Hilda, do you want to reply to that? Well, uh, yes, I'll respond. Thank you, Andrew, for the question. Well, it all started with uh, me having the climate strikes along the street and talking to people, of course, communicating with different people, like just anyone I would find on my way in the street where I stay in my school, in my class. I just used to talk about climate change and sharing my story, my personal story and the experiences I had with climate change. And also um, uh, sharing a lot of information 
because in Uganda, we are not taught about climate change, especially in schools, we are not taught about it. So very few people knew about climate change, even up to now, very few people know about it. But uh, you sharing your own story and what you have passed through is an easier way of um, communicating or letting the other person um, know about what you are really talking about. So me sharing my story with them was easier to explain to them what climate change really is and what is happening here and in the whole worldwide. So uh, that is how I grew the movement. I visited different schools, uh, different communities, um, different regions. I used to go to people's offices, I knock, I talk to them and uh, we, I, uh, people started joining me. So we started to do it together with other people. And it was very easier with other people, of course, around because there we could get a bigger number and um, many people to talk to at once. So uh, that is how the movement kept on growing. So the people you find tell other people about it. Uh, schools started inviting us, communities started inviting us without us going there and they started to join us for the actions and that's how the movement is growing. I hope that helps. Thank you for sharing. Maybe anyone else in the panel wants to pick up on the question as well or respond to what Hilda said. Uh, feel free to um, unmute yourself. Uh, if not, that's also cool. We, we also have another question um, by Annika. Yeah, I think I could maybe say like a little bit, just kind of a comment on that. I really, I really um, like think it's important Hilda, how you mentioned like door knocking and like going to people in person, because um, I think a lot of like, you know, nowadays a lot of um, social justice activism takes place online and that's obviously like really valid and is such a big part of growing a global movement is being able to communicate across um, like borders and like seas and across the whole world. Um, but I think when it comes to like building power in your local community, it like it takes you know, taking people at face value and meeting them where they are and being prepared to explain climate justice without the jargon and like be patient with people and empathetic as to why people might not understand or care about climate change because it's like that's not necessarily their, their fault it's just the society that we've all like we've all found ourselves in is that you know it's difficult to get to a place where you care so much about this so yeah I really respect the fact that you like Kind of relentlessly seem to go and meet people meet meet people where they are so yeah well done for that thanks for sharing um yeah uh annika do you wanna do you wanna pose your question yeah sure um yeah i want to thank you all very much for your super inspiring uh introductions and the work that you're doing um I noticed that the, the youth movement is very um, female and feminist driven, obviously not 100%, but it does seem to me that, you know, there's a lot of uh, young women uh, involved, um, which I think is excellent, taking up this role and um, uh, feeling empowered by that. On the other hand, uh, it also makes me wonder how you look at the fact that it seems that uh, like young women are maybe again carrying a lot of the burden and doing a lot of unpaid labor um, and how you uh, feel about that and if this is something that is discussed within the movement or I would just you know I'm just interested maybe to hear some reflections also if you think I'm just got it completely wrong thanks Anneke yeah if you um, this is a question to everyone, I think, so feel free to respond. Um, well, for me, I think it's mostly just very really empowering. I know that there is, is a lot of different stuff also going on, as you said, uh, women doing like most of unpaid labor again. And yeah, of course, that plays a big part of, in, of it as well. But for me, it's also just really empowering to see so many powerful and strong people and uh, women and well basically just not men because growing up I never really noticed it 
but I didn't have that many, like if you watch the media, there's not a lot of uh, representation and not that many role models you can have. And then I joined this movement and now I have so many to choose from, like everyone you meet and it's just really awesome. And it, it just inspires me so much. So it's also like, yeah, there's maybe might be a bad side about it and like it's complicated, but for me, it's also just really helps me to get to know myself and to understand myself more. Um, so yeah, I think the effects of it can also be really good. For me, it's it's so strange because we don't really have that in the Philippines. Like we are, let me think. Yeah, I think we're pretty balanced in like in terms of um, genders. Um, but I do agree that like internationally, especially, and usually the people who are like speaking and, and talking to people are the are, are girls. And I think that's, as Ian mentioned, is because the climate movement really understands how intersectional it is. And so girls usually are the ones who see and understand the climate crisis more. And because women and young children are also some of the most vulnerable um, to the climate crisis, then there's also that part that you also feel more uh, like more attached to the climate, not attached to the climate crisis, but you resonate with the impacts of the climate crisis more. And so it's something that um, more girls are coming into. But I think it's also really important to on that note of like unpaid labor, it's it's also really important to make sure that we don't just like organize girls and we also organize guys as well, because it is something that's happening to everyone. And it's not just about gender, it's also about class, it's also about race, and it's also about all these things. Um, so it's really definitely a tricky subject to talk about. But I personally, I've never really noticed that like unpaid labor aspect in terms of gender basically because in the Philippines, we are pretty balanced, but internationally, it is mostly girls, but I think the guys who are there are pulling their weight more or less. Uh, Freya, do you also want to respond? Yeah, um, I mean, in terms of like my personal journey, I think like being involved with climate activism has definitely made me more of a feminist and that like growing up, I never really faced like I was never like really faced that much sexism or like misogyny like I was very lucky in that regard but once you start analyzing like power structures and both within organizing and within you know the people that you're confronting the politicians there's absolutely that element of gender uh, playing a role in that um I think as a young woman people kind like people see you as as this perception that you're just like whiny the whiny like crying young girl um who like needs to go over herself and is like over emotional um and I think that that power dynamic that kind of perception really manifests itself um in that relationship with like politicians that I've had um and I think that that really empowered me to connect you know my personal experience of feminism um with that but also to understand how different groups also face that oppression, like how communities of color face that oppression too. Um, and, you know, gay communities, anti-Semitism, all of working class um, oppression, all of those forms of oppression, how they manifest themselves um, in that political landscape and obviously on a daily basis. Um, and I think, like leading on from what Mitzi said, I think it's really important that we are talking about feminism from the perspective of women, but also from the perspective of men. Um, Cause I've had a lot of chats with like male friends in the climate movement. And from that, I realized that how much the patriarchy works both ways. Like we're not the only ones that are affected. Sure, we're the ones that normally pay for it with, um, you know, very horrific circumstances. Um, there was a massive thing a year ago with um, a woman who was killed by the police in the UK, a police officer, which was, um, you know, kind of brought that to light a lot. But I think that in terms of mental health, especially how it affects male people, um, people who I've seen as male is definitely something that I didn't really think about much before. And I think that we need to come together and we need to have conversations about that um, and how we can work to build to like 
dismantle that um, and dismantle the patriarchy and understand each other better in terms of how that affects our daily lives. Yeah, thanks, Freya. Could yeah, I just maybe... have a short point here as well? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, something that came up for me there is just like, um, you know, the climate justice movement isn't perfect as well. And like in my experiences of organizing in the UK, I have had like instances um, of organizing with men where like something they've said is like maybe like kind of um, like rub me up the wrong way or just like seemed like a bit tone deaf or that they're not like, you know, like not really getting it right. And I think there's a kind of assumption in social justice spaces that everyone in them is like, has a full understanding of like, you know, feminism and racism and all these problems, but that's actually not the case. And like um, with like, you know, some groups in particular that I, I won't name because that's not the point, but like I've heard a lot of like accounts of racism and, um, you know, homophobia and, like sexism and all the rest and that's not to say don't like get involved in things if you aren't already because you know these are problems that we face anywhere like no matter what spaces that we run in yeah it's it's less in climate justice and social justice spaces but they're not perfect so I would just say like to any like men in in this space right now any like white people in this space any straight people in this space like please be mindful of those who like face um systemic oppression that you don't face um in your organizing spaces and like be ready to call it out and actually like act to make sure that your, your spaces are safe because i think this is why like you know in the uk the climate justice movement for example is very white because you know people in the uk can be very racist and i think that permeates in social justice spaces as well so we need to make sure that these spaces are accessible for everyone so whilst we want to get more men involved and get everyone involved, we need to also make sure that it is an absolute priority that these spaces are safe for everyone because otherwise like the right people are just not going to get involved. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, we, we have uh, another very affirmative comment in the comment section uh, by Tara. Um, and we also have um, a comment by Friday. Uh, Friday, do you want to unmute yourself? Friday, are you here? Um, all right. If not, then perhaps. Uh, uh, okay, can I add my voice now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, that's fine. Uh, from uh, Nigeria. It is uh, my privilege to be here. And I send my solidarity to all of you. A wonderful contribution from uh, the last speaker and even uh, the other person. But I want to add this on my experience in terms of activism and demanding for justice, especially in the, in the, the local, local environment, as in the grassroots uh, area. Because I have discovered that uh, for a sustainable uh, struggle, we need to include and bring the young people in. Um, this, for me, oh, this is best done by uh, engaging the, the high school student in, we call it secondary school in Nigeria, in the high school. We built a, 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 a activism group um, maybe once in a month, you go there to know them, you teach them, encourage them to know what you know, to understand why we have to solidarity come together. So building, it is a kind of a strategy that we have to use, especially in the local environment, in the local level. And I remember one of the programs I did on climate change, um, we are talking about a coal mining issue in Nigeria. Um, the only way we win the battle was to go to the grassroots, the community, and split to them the impact of coal mining in the, in the environment, and bring to them why we have to resist the, the forces from 
a Dangote a company and, and others, uh, so a company that was operating at that area. So we, we, we came out with a success story because uh, the community was involved. The community was not just involved, but we passed through secondary school. You can see when the children, young people will go to the house and tell the parent, hello, daddy, please, this ones are here today. They say, uh, this uh, suit, particularly from this school, is affecting us. What can we do? And daddy will not contribute. So much often, it is advisable, or uh, to me, it is advisable, we'll go back to the grassroots area and mobilize the young people through that, uh, that school, the high school student. Then again, the women, the women, I'm not a woman, but the women have to come in. They are another tools, a very important tools of uh, demanding for justice. Right. Friday, your internet connection is having an issue. I when think. women speak, especially in Nigeria, when women All right, Friday, you're. I think you're breaking off. Uh, perhaps, if you want to finish your point, you can type it into the comment uh, box. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, uh, anyone wants to respond or you know has any other thoughts on what was said. I I I do. I mean, I think in this regard, what just came up, I think it's interesting that the youth movement is like uh, targeting very, very closely to uh, institutions that are very central to reproduction in society, the school and the family, right? Um, and which are not, uh, not institutions of production. So even if you have a big climate strike, uh, uh, usually a shell can continue digging oil. But somehow these strikes have nevertheless been really, really successful in creating some form of pressure. So I think it's it's interesting thinking about that and, and thinking about how that also links to um, uh, feminist struggles, which have been often, you know, taking place in, in the sphere of reproduction. I mean, the, the women's strikes are, um, are a, a good example for that. Um, so we have maybe time for one more question. Um, uh, it could be from the audience or it could be a reaction from the panel. Um, if it's from the audience, feel free to type in the chat. Or, okay, Sunny has a question. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry, Kathy. Uh, I, Sunny was first. I hope it's okay if Sunny asked it and maybe we can get yours as well. Um, Sunny, do you want to ask yours first? Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity and so nice to see uh, all of the activists uh, from the climate justice movement that I follow on social media here in the in the in the zoom call. Um, my question really is, um, as you can see, the gray hair, I'm an I'm an older person almost uh, approaching 58. How can uh, my generation be I'm cognizant of the fact of the damage that our generation did to the environment? Um, what role can we play effectively to uh, serve as allies of the youth movement? I really, really uh, um, am sincere when I say that um, I am led and I feel led by the youth climate activists because I'm, I have a lot of faith that they will deliver uh, what is required. And I, I, and I apologize for the burden that they have to, they have to carry. So in, what can my generation do to reinforce um, uh, and to support and be a, 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 a genuine and sincere ally. Thank you, um, Sunny. I can... uh, just maybe we'll take this one together with the question that Kathy posed uh, in the comments, which is, has anyone approached the military police security companies um, to educate them? If yes, have, any had, have you had any success? So maybe we'll take these two questions together um, yeah, Mitzi, do you want to uh, reply? Yeah, um, I'll reply to Sunny's question because I, well, I can kind of touch on Kathy's, I guess, but um, I actually hate the idea of adults as allies 
Um, I hate the idea of young activists and adult climate activists because it's this thing that's made us believe that the older generation is the cause of the climate crisis when it's not the older generation. It's just a very specific set of the older generation. And it will one day be a very specific set of the younger generation if we keep doing this. It is the fossil fuel industries. It is the multinational companies. It is the billionaires. It's not all old people. and It's not, it's not all young people who are helping fix things. There are young people who are doing bad things too and contributing to the climate crisis just as much. And so for me, using the word ally separates you from us and rather I think it would be better if we see each other as part of one coalition as one part of one as part of one community as comrades rather than allies and I think that's the best way to really support the youth movement is to see yourself as part of us to be with us to just fight alongside us and support in whatever way because there's so much that young movements can also learn from the older generations and there's also so much that the older generations can learn from the young movements and I think that's really how you build a movement that will bring down the system that we have, one that is united across generations. And for the second question, I personally would never risk our safety enough to approach any kind of military, police, or security, um, because I feel like that is something that would, I think, it, yeah, no, I, there, I, I, how do I say this? There are people who are safer to approach and I'll get farther if I approach them instead. So I'll leave the security and police and military to whoever wants to talk to them. But I know I never want to. Um, I think I can add a, a bit on the like intergenerational approach as well. Um, I think like something tangibly that, you know, older generations can do is to like, you know educate yourself on ageism and try and tackle that in yourselves as much as you would any other form of systemic oppression um because i think even though like in these spaces we're aware of ageism um i think people don't generally have the same understanding of it as they do with other issues um and I see so often, um, just like in life generally, um, people being belittled or like um, condescended because because of their age. Like, you know, some of the panelists in this call are still teenagers and have a couple years of being teenagers left. I think generally people who are around like 18 you know young adults like just becoming adults are seen like are, are kind of like people older people consider like they know better than them and the um you know oh it's just like young people they don't they don't really know anything yet they don't really understand like you'll understand one day when you're older but i think like older people really need to tackle that belief in themselves because there is so much that young people understand in a way that is just different from the way that older adults understand. And like, because of the situation we're in with the climate crisis, I think often the youth understand it even more because we're more worried about it and spend more time educating ourselves on it. Um, so I guess, yeah, just like actively listen to youths when, when they might tell you like oh, that that comment might be a bit ageist or like could you maybe reconsider this like be open to criticism and be open to learning about how to actually platform youth and not just kind of use you know youth activism as a buzzword but actually be committed to like the long-term goal of fighting ageism just as you would any other form of systemic oppression and thank you for the question it's uh, really important thank you lauren um I'm just uh, glancing at the time. I think uh, we have about 15 minutes left. So um, what we really wanted to do, I think, is for the last 15 minutes. Um, and I think uh, the math is quite good. We have we have five panelists, so everyone has like three minutes um, to maybe do a little like New Year's resolution or like uh, what's what's in for the climate justice movement and the youth movement specifically in the in the coming year. What have you planned? I think. Um, uh, as a way to wrap up the session. So yeah, uh, whoever wants to start with that and then we'll do like three minutes approximately per person. And you can also use the time to say anything else you still wanted to say. 
Um, yeah, I'll just, uh, Jante, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Okay. So the, what your new year's resolution is for your climate movement, right? Okay. I haven't really thought about this yet, so I'll be improvising a bit, but that's fine. Um, I think what is the most important thing for uh, Fridays for Future in the Netherlands is to connect more with other countries, especially MAPA countries, and learn more from them and um, also use that in our actions um, and like lift the, their voices. And I think that is a very important thing. Um, and yeah, it's just really important to talk more to different countries because we're all in our own bubble. Um, and we need to make sure that we like have this movement with all of us and are fighting together and not just as different uh, small groups. So I think that's the most important thing for us. Oh, I'll pass, pass it on to Hilda. Uh, um, my resolution or our uh, resolution as Friday's of Future Uganda is action. <clears throat> so the past two years there has been less action because of the restrictions and uh, you know COVID and stuff. But this year we are finding new means of how to have uh, these uh, action oriented activities in line with COVID because this doesn't seem like it's gonna end anytime. So we, uh, we we have more ideas of how to do, how, how to have these actions going in line with the COVID. And of course, including uh, working together with other organizations, both local and international. And we've always had a big problem with media. So this year is, uh, we want to make it better, more engage more media here in Uganda so that they can help us create massive massive climate awareness, even in you know areas where it doesn't reach. And about the fossil fuel industry, uh, what I uh, what I want to say is because I'm also part of the Stop ECOP campaign, and this is uh, uh, a campaign where we want to we want to tell to stop the construction of the East African crude oil pipeline that passes through Uganda and Tanzania, and um, I would say that um, the only way to avoid uh, climate catastrophe and you know uh, keep the 1.5 degree target alive is to um, make sure that there's no oil and gas and also uh, to phase out the fossil fuel industry together and for good because that is the only way we can uh, stay alive. And we can only do this if we come together. Um, and it won't be an easy path, but um, there will be waves along, but it would be easier if we do this together, uh, regardless of the age, regardless of the generation, regardless of a color or status, we have to fight together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to pass it on? I pass it on to Mitzi. Um, I think Ianta and, and Hilda already both mentioned it, but really that importance of coming together and showing solidarity. We really have to get angry and, and work together so much to really expose this imperialist system as the cause of the climate crisis. We really have to start putting more pressure on the global north, especially. And that means global north movements need to be in solidarity more with global south movements, need to connect more with global south movements. And that way, our activism becomes more holistic in a way that you know that you're fighting for not just your own country, but really for a friend, with a friend, and a completely different country that's already experiencing the climate crisis today. We need to ground ourselves. And for movements in the global south, it's also so important for us. Like for me, I am a privileged student who has had the privilege to have education and to speak in English. And we have to ground ourselves in movements of the farmers and of the fisher folk and of the workers and of the indigenous peoples. And it's really just about constantly acknowledging the different levels of privilege and 
listening to the people who are less privileged than we are because there's always someone who is less privileged but those people are also the ones who are resisting more and there's so much to learn from that resistance and really that's what we need really awakening that political consciousness in in the different classes and really coming together and fighting and honestly it it sounds so scary and there's so much to think of and so much to look at but it's just one day at a time and one step at a time. And just remember that you aren't alone in this. I don't know how to stress that enough because especially I think next month, there's a new IPCC report coming out, which is like the impacts of the climate, like it's, it's an update on the climate impact. And I know that so many people, I me, myself included, um, will probably get like a lot of climate anxiety with that because this is the same report that had leaks last year if you guys saw those leaks online where it really just detailed all the impacts of the climate that's coming out so it can be really really heavy but it's also a great time to really organize people who aren't into the climate crisis yet and so there's a lot for us to do but then it's also a really overwhelming time for us who already know what's going to be in the report so it's going to be you know a lot of work but just remember that you're not alone in this and that we're all in this together and victory is possible and it is inevitable because you know empires have fallen in the past and it's only about it's only a matter of time until you know the capitalist system falls as well um Freya I think like my biggest like desire for the movement uh for this year would be to expand our understanding and our like um our demanding for justice um, I think that a lot of people in the UK have an incredibly limited understanding of the climate crisis in terms of it being like an impact, something that's like 20 years down the line and something that's not completely created by the by capitalism and imperialism in terms of how much we disregard those countries in the global south. Um, so I think we need to draw the be better at drawing these connections between the different movements, between the migrant solidarity, but migrant justice movement. 26 people died in the channel because of the UK's disgusting migrant, anti-migrant policies for wars they helped create in like last December. Like that's abhorrent. And drawing connections between how the how air pollution is impacting communities in London, black, like pr primarily black and brown communities in London. Um, and in different cities across the UK and understanding these elements of justice and community and how are, we have to fight all of these systems in order to create, in order for, for, for us to solve the crisis and in order for us to, you know, be free. Um, so I think that, and I think the way that we do that is by creating communities and getting out in our community and building things, um, both in person and online. Um, yeah, um, and I think another like personal thing is also mental health um, in the, it's very difficult to be a climate activist in terms of your mental health. And I think like if we can, in our communities, when we're doing that, create conversations around that and create a culture where it's okay to be burnt out because you're basically always burnt out if you're a climate activist. You've got like so much going on. You've got like school other, all your life. And then that on top, you're like, oh my God. Um, so I think if we can create communities where that's something that's very like grounded and talked about and at the forefront of it, because it is so important, um, that would be something I would love to see improve um, in climate activism. I think it's just me left maybe so I'll jump in um yeah thank you it's so it's so nice to hear everyone's like wishes and aspirations for this year it's something that I've been thinking about a lot I, I really like this time of year for like reflecting and taking stock of what what the year has brought you and um really like strongly visioning what what you want to see for the year ahead and um yeah I've, I've been taking some time to do that and you know, I mentioned earlier on um, that Cambo, uh, the Cambo oil field in the UK is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of um, new fossil fuel projects. There's 39 other coal, oil and gas projects that are due to be approved just in the next 
three or four years. So I think a lot of my work is going to be around making sure that not a single one of them goes ahead. Um, and just, <laughs> just really like focusing on, focusing in on this active hope that I've kind of drummed up in myself in the past several months. Um, yeah, I, I genuinely do believe that like a big reason why we were so successful is because we relentlessly actively believed that we were going to win, even on our bad days, even if, you know, sometimes you don't actually believe it, you're just pretending you do to make your friends happier and like create a, you know, a positive culture. That's okay. Like I would implore all of you to like, really this year work on that belief, like envision that 2022 is going to be the year that we completely turn the tide on climate justice because why why not like we only have so much time left um before we see like runaway climate change on a like on a scale that is absolutely unfathomable and don't get me wrong it's a it's just a difference between catastrophic climate change which is already definitely happening and like complete world destruction and extinction and personally i'm not i'm not prepared <laughs> to live through that. So um, I don't think any of you here want to either. So even if we don't actually believe that we are gonna win at the moment, please, please just try because it has actually had such a massive impact on the effectiveness of my campaigning, not constantly feeling crap about everything and about the state of things and like actually believing that we can make change. So yeah, my, my biggest resolutions for this year is to keep working on that keep shutting down those oil fields, keep bringing shell to its knees. And uh, like, as all of you have so like eloquently just mentioned, um, keep building that global sol solidarity. And yeah, that's something that I'm like, really, really like grateful to hear firsthand experiences of. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And definitely global sol solidarity for the win. And um, thank you all so much for coming and listening, by the way. I'll pass back to the moderator. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, I think these are some really great, great words. Thanks, uh, comrades. Thanks, everyone, for sharing. Um, yeah, I, I guess we're ending somewhere in between hope and anger. <laughs> I think that's good. Um, and uh, lots of solidarity. I hope like we could feel the solidarity a little bit today. And uh, maybe there's some connections made today. Some people getting to know each other will be, certainly be in touch and thinking about also how to put the solidarity into practice through different forms of actions. I think that's something that we're gonna be thinking about this year. Uh, I don't want to hold uh, everyone up much longer. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, we'll have a Shamist Fall info session in three minutes. <laughs> um, but yeah, feel free, free to drop out um, and uh, let's be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Maybe if I can add something, uh, Elias. Yeah, I think this was a super inspirational session. Uh, I also wanted to say that I will be hosting the session on Shell Must Fall. It will not be super long. I'll try to keep it to half an hour. But yeah, like Elias is saying, of course, feel free to leave um, and uh, take a rest and enjoy your Sunday. Uh, let's have a short comfort break and then um, we'll continue with whoever wants to continue. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you can't put everyone on an email, uh, the email addresses of everyone, so that, that people will be able to be in contact with each other. I'm from South Africa, from Durban, where, where the Shell um, uh, ship was, was, was bombing our, our our east coast and and the activism was amazing and and now they were the government allowed them to come and and now they a new judgment brought by an ngo caused shell's uh, seismic boat ship to depart from our shores 
Thanks, Coral. Yeah, we've been we've been following this from afar, and um, it looked like an amazing success. And uh, and yesterday we had a debate as well about where the ship is going next, and it's going to Argentina, and there's some activists there. So I think we're definitely going to take the suggestion. We have the email list with everyone. I think it's always a matter of privacy, but I think what we're going to do is send an email um, to everyone who is who signed up for the conference. And if they want, they can reply to that and then we can make a little group and stay in touch. I think we're definitely going to do that. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, to everyone who's just joined, we're still taking a short break and then I think uh, Annika will be back and we're having a little Shamist Fall intro session. So.